We now come to introduce the Entrepreneurial Strategy Compass. The idea here is to organize the literature on advocated strategies for entrepreneurs, and we orient and organize them via our two-pronged dimension for the choice of competition. Recall that that choice was firstly one of orientation. Are you going to position yourself to collaborate or cooperate with established firms in a market or to compete with them? And secondly, uh, your choice of where you're going to invest. Are you going to invest in execution that develops the capabilities for you to continue to compete in the future? Or are you going to invest in control, which is a desire to develop essentially a moat that is going to prevent others from competing with you in the future? As you can see, the broadly speaking, those choices of those dimensions give rise to four possible constellations that you might uh, uh, be able to fall into. And these can actually be quite helpful in actually thinking about how to formulate your entrepreneurial strategy. In particular, they can all be given a label that corresponds to a strategy in the literature. Let's see how they play out with an actual example. We've had competition recently in mobile and taxi limo services. Now, back around 2011, 2012, when those industries were in their infancy, uh, they still kind of are, of course, uh, we had many different entrants doing different things. Here are some of them. Uber, you'll recognize. Lyft, old uh, thing is third there. We had other startups called Halo and one ha hankering out of Toronto called Winston. Each of these ones pursued different elements initially on the compass that we've given you before, specifically this. Uber, we are most familiar with, was a disruptor. What it was trying to do was compete head to head with existing firms and try to be uh, execute in a way uh, that allowed them to reduce price and compete very intensely. It wasn't trying to lock people into a network or anything like that, uh, and it didn't have any special intellectual property, given all this entry occurring. Lyft, on the other hand, at least initially had an idea of trying to get a community around ride sharing. That's why it was firstly oriented not at the limo services, but at cheaper services and trying to emphasize sharing and social aspects. Now, to be sure, Uber and Lyft are, are looking closer and closer today. It's unclear where on the execute control things they rank, but of course they're still competing. Contrast that with Halo, which came out of London. They wanted to be the ride-sharing app that dealt ex with the existing taxi services. So they weren't trying to compete with it or recruit different drivers, but to provide the ability for people to hail using a mobile device and pay for it on the app. So Halo was partnering for various taxi services, and it, it was worldwide. Now, it's since had, uh, had to scale back and hasn't really worked out. Uh, but what it was trying to do, and this is the important part, was to collaborate uh, with existing taxi services. And at least at the time, it was unclear that that was the wrong way to go because regulation was certainly on the side of that. In that same mode was Winston, which was choosing... Uh, to cooperate as well, um, but it was doing so by providing the underlying software that it would allow taxi cab companies to develop uh, ride-sharing uh, cap hailing capabilities themselves. And so they were licensing that and licensing that services, so they were keeping a tight control over their own intellectual property, but making it available to taxi companies and maybe others all around the world. So these were very different positions initially in the control space. And that's what gives rise to our compass. And we can provide labels for all these strategies, some of which may be familiar to you. Those labels are this. If you choose to exercise invest in control, but try and cooperate, you're pursuing what we call an intellectual property strategy. 
basically you're going to try to be a pure seller of the ideas or IP and not do much else, but you're going to integrate with existing value chain, but you're not going to let anyone else do whatever your idea is. So it's intellectual property strategy is a good name for that. On the other diagonal, uh, we have uh, a compete and execution strategy, which is what we call disruption. Disruption is, by definition, competing head-to-head -head against existing firms and building out a new value chain. But it also has elements of execution. It doesn't necessarily believe in uh, uh, taking control of an industry and building out a moat, but just competing intensively and continuing to do so. Also on that line, you could, of course, invest in execution, but slot yourself into an existing value chain not competing head-to-head -head with downstream and other firms, but being able to do well in a segment of that value. And finally, we have a strategy that's quite hard to actually do, which is to both compete and also invest in control at the same time. We'll find under architectural strategy, where you're trying to architect essentially a new value chain, a new value proposition, generally tend to be ones that are pursued or evolved to, by firms doing something very, very new. Not always. As I said, Uber and Lyft have sort of moved in that direction a little bit. Uh, but for companies like Facebook are ones that are going to fall squarely in that domain, which have network effects to give you control, but they're competing head to head with other services. So in each of these are basically a group of distinct customer, technology, identity, and of course, competition. And they can be described in this way. And so you'll see in what follows a lot of these cards describing what these different strategies do. Here is a very high level approach for the intellectual property strategy. But we can also delve down into it and provide a little bit more detail and some examples of companies that have pursued it. Notice at the bottom there, we've got two things. We've got two uh, little uh, uh, light bulbs, one with sprouting something, another with a wedge. Uh, that are basically telling us what our value creation and value capture hypotheses are for each sort of strategy. The idea is that when you pursue a strategy, it's still an experiment. And so you have a hypothesis. If this strategy will work out in creating value if the following is true. This strategy will also allow me to capture value if the following is true. So when you actually implement that strategy, you are testing these hypotheses. And it may turn out to be confirmed, but it may turn out also to be overturned. Now, in the reading materials, we talk a lot more about that. And that is certainly something that will get built on more in CDL Advanced. But it's something to be aware of through our discussions in this particular course. So we have cards also for disruption strategy, value change strategy, an architectural strategy. And you can download these as slides for your reference whenever you choose. Now we're going to go through each of these four strategies in much greater detail with examples and examples of how the different customer, technology, identity, and of course competition choices fit together.